You found it. Your home for the best content on your favorite team, the Fighting Tigers of LSU. Do us a favor, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments below, and be sure to smash that like button. LSU Offensive Coordinator Joe Sloan uh, met with reporters after practice on Tuesday. And, you know, one of the things going into uh, to this spring was a, a storyline, a talking point, something we were all watching are the new coaches, right? And most of our focus has been on the defensive side because the defense was awful last year. Naturally. I mean, you turned over your entire defensive staff. Blake Baker is back as defense. You, you know it all, right? Bo Davis and Corey Raymond, and you know it. Well, to a lesser extent, we focused on the offensive turnover. And a big part of that, naturally, is you know, Mike Denbrock left, and now Joe Sloan and Cortez Hankton have been elevated as co-OCs. But I, honestly, I, I feel like most people just ear to ground. And listen, if you disagree with me, drop your comments, let me know. But... I kind of feel like most people have a great sense of calm and a belief in the offense. And maybe it's because they were so elite last year. And we saw the second half of 2022 when Jaden really started to emerge. Um, and then we saw Sloan and Nussmeyer put up 500 yards and 35 points in the bowl game. And Sloan's called plays before. And Garrett's a veteran player quarterback even though he hasn't played a ton and you're always going to have weapons so I, I just feel like the anxiety or the question levels around the offense are just much less than the defense for obvious reasons even after losing your OC your Heisman winning quarterback and two first round picks at receiver which say that out loud say that out loud and and then like put yourself in a football mindset as a football fan which we all are and say that out loud and realize how ridiculous it is that we have no concern whatsoever about the offense you lost your OC, who was a finalist for the Broyles Award, your Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, and two first round picks at receiver. And we're all like, eh. <laughs> I mean, it's almost absurd that we are that nonchalant about it. I mean, if you just think back to like 2019, when you lose Burrow and Jefferson and Chase, now Chase was coming back, but then opted out. And obviously, Joe Brady had left after that season, and it wasn't as good offensively in 2020. Um, but they had their own issues with defense. And anyway, I am interested, though, in the in how some of the new staff is going to come together. I would say most notably Slade Nagel, because while Mike Denbrock was the offensive coordinator, the other component of Mike Denbrock's job is he was your tight ends coach, and. One of the things we've talked about from the day, literally from the day Brian Kelly was hired at LSU, that he pumps, he develops and pumps talent into the NFL at a greater rate at two positions than any other. Offensive line, tight end. Brian Kelly had more tight ends drafted during his decade at Notre Dame than LSU has had from present day all the way, you have to go all the way back to 1982 to find that the amount of time it took LSU to get the same number of tight ends drafted as Brian Kelly had drafted in a decade in South Bend. It's not even debatable. Like, that's where he's been elite. Well, that was Mike Denbrock's position group as well. And, boy, they added Mason Taylor and Mac Markway and Camorian Pimpton, and they had Jackson McGowan, who's now transferred, and now you got Trey Des Green coming in. So that's Slade Nagel now. How does Slade Nagel handle that position group? And Slade Nagel's also going to be working with the special teams, but that's one of the things that Joe Sloan was asked about when he met with reporters was Slade Nagel and what he brings to the staff. Really when we wanted to add a tight end coach in terms of somebody who had call plays before, somebody who understood how we put all the things together from an offensive standpoint, I think what Slade did at Tulane for the last couple years speaks for itself. And I think he brings a ton of value to what we're doing and how we're trying to expand our offense and do some different things and a variety of things I think that match our, our current personnel and the personnel we'll, you know, we'll have in the future, right? That's what we always want to do. But his ability to do that, he's been a football coach a long, long time. I've known him uh, since I first got in the state and been uh, friends a long time. The relationship 
relationship that we have, the honesty that we can have back and forth, and that he can have amongst our staff, right, with he and Cortez and myself and, and really everybody in the room. But he th- brings a huge value from a, I think, a development standpoint of the tight ends and just his coaching ability. But on top of that, his ability to help in terms of formate things and make sure we're attacking people the right way, especially when it comes to the run game. Yes, Nagel was at Tulane for eight years. Seven of those he coached tight ends, and they that was during the stretch where they had maybe their greatest season ever, where they went to the Cotton Bowl and beat Southern Cal, and obviously you had Michael Pratt in that offense. So that was a really fun, dynamic offense that Slade Nagel was coaching tight ends and then ultimately also as the offensive coordinator. So you got a guy with a lot of skins on the wall, and then you bring in – or you understand that who he's inheriting in that room is Mason Taylor and, the fa- and just the key role that Taylor plays in the LSU offense. And it's so interesting to me that there's this perception that Mason Taylor um, – didn't have a great season as a sophomore. Now, part of it was he he had the shoulder injury, but the other part of it is like you just didn't see a a year one to year two leap as a freshman. Mason Taylor had thirty eight catches for four fourteen and three scores, so thirty eight for four fourteen. As a sophomore, he had thirty six for three forty eight, so he has about sixty or seventy yards, seventy yards less, and two fewer car- uh, c- uh, catches. But essentially on par year to year, there wasn't a big disparity. It was similar. the The massive difference, though, in twenty twenty three is you had two thousand yard <laughs> receivers in Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas. So those guys were going to get the ball fed to them more so than Taylor. This year with no Malik Neighbors and no Brian Thomas, and you don't have that, those no doubt surefire one-two punch tandem that's going to be your dominant receiver group, that may emerge. It stands to reason that Mason Taylor may have a better year. Here, by the way, was Joe Sloan on LSU's junior tight end. Mason Taylor is one of our best football players. Uh, LSU fans know him for the last two years and just his consistency and his ability to make plays. And I think we want to find ways to get him the ball. And I think you could see Nuss working his way or it, obviously we're going to go where the read takes us, but putting him in positions where he potentially is the first, second or, or third read where the ball maybe will find him a, a, a little bit more. But I think, you know, just from a consistency standpoint and uh, an experience standpoint, he obviously brings a ton. Um, and I think he's one of the best tight ends in the country. And we want to definitely want to utilize him that way. One other piece about Taylor that I, we shouldn't miss is his physical development. Remember, one of the, I would call it a knock or a criticism or um, one, one area that everyone agreed Taylor could, could grow was, was physically growing. When Mason Taylor signed, he was listed at 6'4", 230. When he signed two years ago, he was listed at 6'4", 230. Now, after two years at LSU, Mason Taylor is listed at 6'6", 255. So he's grown an inch and a half, because he was 6'4 and a half, an inch and a half and put on 25 pounds. So you're talking about a guy that has not only grown in the game, but physically grown. And when you're 6'6", 255, you can be that hand-in-the-dirt inline blocker and still maintain your athleticism and be a a great pass catcher. So I'm going to be fascinated to watch to see if this is – the year where you see Mason Taylor at, like double that production. Does he go from 38 catches for 400 yards to 65 catches, 850 yards, and seven touchdowns? And I think LSU might need that dynamic within the offense. And one more from Sloan on that group, and it's the other tight ends there in the room that are there right now. Our other young tight ends, uh, when you look at Pimp and, and uh, Mac Markway, just how they've grown and how we're trying to grow the offense and use those guys more multiple. You know, when we first got here, that was a room that really had to be rebuilt. And Coach Kelly and Coach Dembrock started that. And obviously they have a huge, you know, Coach Kelly has a huge history with tight ends and what he's done with them over several years. But we wanted to grow that room. And I think we're close, right? We're close to getting there. Um, and if, you know, when you guys had an opportunity to be out at practice a little bit, I think you can see just how we want to use those guys a little bit more, just within the framework of what we do on on offense uh it's a year where I think you should be excited about the tight ends Mac Markway played a bunch as a true freshman Mason Taylor going in now his junior year Camorian Pimpton who is I've described him as a pterodactyl like he should be a red zone mismatch that he should be a touchdown vulture you get inside the 10 88 should be in the game as you go through a jump ball and then I could say the same for Trey Des Green the freshman coming in when he gets on campus who could could 
have a similar impact. I mean, he's 6'8", with that wingspan, basketball player, can jump. Yeah, I mean, you got mismatches around the red zone. It's going to be fun to watch those guys this year. Like I keep saying, offensively, I think they're going to be great offensively again. It's just going to be different. You're not going to have a quarterback that runs it 135 times. You're not going to have 2,000-yard receivers. You know, it's just going to – you're not going to have eight scholarship running backs. I think the results are going to be great. The fun part is going to be watching how those results manifest and they're well on their way. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please leave your comments. I love to interact. And be sure to hit the red subscribe button below.